All right, champion, so we're back with this Mesa. Customary synchronization clap. Um, we're gonna change out the screen grids. So, you can see, in the previous video we measured them. <clears throat> they weren't that far out of spec, they are probably within their tolerance. But we're noticing that, it's kind of hard to see there, but the solder connections are really gray and cracked. That indicates that they got so hot that they almost melted their own connections. Uh, so we're going to up the rating. So when you up the rating, they still dissipate the same amount of heat, but the package of the resistor is larger. So it has a more effective uh, heat dissipation to the surrounding air. Um, so we're going to upgrade that with 5 watt uh, wire wounds. You could use metal oxide if you want. I've just got wire wounds in stock. And uh, just position them carefully and make sure we don't melt any insulation on the surrounding wires as we do it. I've got to establish a little uh, path for the soldering iron to reach down there without melting any surrounding insulation on the wires. <clears throat> There we go. You can see there the uh, all the bands look black. So the paint gets really hot and degrades and turns to carbon. So you can't really tell what the resistor color codes are trying to tell you. So often, uh, in this case, it's just a screen grid resistor. So for these valves, you could go 470 to 1K. These are 1K and the circuit says 1K, schematic says 1K. Um, but if you had some circuit, more complex circuit, where you don't have a schematic, uh, determining that resistor value can get a little bit difficult if uh, you're not used to that particular circuit and the color bands have all gone black. Because you can't measure the resistor because it's already either drifted or gone open circuit in that condition. Um, carbon compositions tend to drift even when they're not ridiculously hot and go upwards in value metal films wire wounds they just go open circuit because it's like a fuse all right so we've removed our supply wire there just going to uh, remove the solder from this tag strip there's another one over here some fresh solder on there. So we've got the new flux. Alright, so they're removed. Okay, get down there and remove the solder from the uh, valve socket as well. Again, trying not to melt anything in the process. Tricky getting in there at a right angle. Alright, grab some new resistors. So here are some new uh, VCHA 5 watt 1k 5% wire wound resistors. I try to use these ones where I can. Um, these are the other type, very common, probably twice the size and about twice the mass. I try to avoid using these if I can, um, just because a smaller resistor means better airflow in that area, less mass means less likely to crack at solder connections, and in my opinion they just look cooler. <laughs> right, so while we're in this area, I thought I'd clean up the uh, surrounding wiring. It was just tack soldered, so when we say tack soldered, um, it generally means that you've just got a blob of solder, you've melted it and you just touch the wire to it until a solder set. So it's not actually mechanically passing through or being crimped to anything. It's also not great to just throw the wire through the eyelet like this, that's passing through that terminal, and just solder it in place, because sideways flex over time will um, crack that solder joint around the wire. So 
what I like to do is actually just even if you just get a 90 degree on there like that just so it's so that's already sturdy and it doesn't even have solder on it yet so that's what you want to aim for um, this is the feedback connection coming from the 8 ohm tap Oop. so we'll just uh, connect the output transformer properly and then we'll wrap this one around through the same side just fold them over like that and then they're mechanically sound before we even introduce solder to the equation <clears throat> fresh solder, fresh flux hold it still until it sets and I'd have a lot more faith in that connection so I've just arranged the wires a little bit more logically so they're not pulling real tight, there's not a lot of slack on this uh, secondary of the output transformer so now there's less tension on the wires just cut off the excess there clean up the snips all the time don't leave them floating around the chassis, you forget about them we'll connect the connection to the screen grid which uh, then finds its way down to the preamp nodes so this is basically the preamp supply line again we'll fold the lead over a bit give it some sold air Alrighty, so we're going to whack a new set of valves in there. 6L6s, this amp can take EL34s or 6L6s. Uh, the customers opted for 6L6, so we'll put them in. A new mash quad from JJ's. Uh, we'll pack the unit up a little bit so the valve's got clearance to the bench and we'll start doing a, some initial testing. Alright champions, so another day's passed, I got distracted and uh, you know, busy in the shop, so this got put aside. Um, <clears throat> but in the meantime, I've replaced the screen grids with some uh, with those uh, Vichy resistors we were talking about last time. You can see the little green buggers down there. Uh, so we're gonna just fire it up slowly. We've got the um, the switch on the back set to 6L6 mode. We've got four new JJ 6L6s installed a match quad and we've got the bias probes on the inner two. We'll check them, providing everything looks okay, then we'll flick them over and check the outer ones too, just make sure everything's reasonably matched. I am gonna make a uh, bias probe box that allows you to make uh, uh, four probes, uh, one box, one multimeter, so you can switch between each one, similar to the, I think Weber have have one but with one of those crappy built-in meters this one's just going to be a switch um, that allows you to use a decent meter that has your min max settings on it so you can monitor it for a longer time um, or you can use the probes individually if you got if you missed the money bags and you got four individual meters you can you can do that as well but uh, yeah keep an eye on future videos we'll we'll do that one when, when we've got time and we'll put a little parts list down the bottom so you can build your own All right so we've got the variac to bring it up to fine tune it to 120 volts. The Variac is just another transformer. It will get loaded down as well, so the voltage will drop a little when we uh, when we fire up the amp. Um, and we'll we'll bring it up and just check everything as we go. We've checked all the voltages prior in the previous video before uh, putting any valves in there, but now we've got some valves in. We'll check it. We'll check that we're not overrunning on the uh, output stage dissipation. And well, we've got it up. We'll just check for any weird behaviour. Check the switching works. Check all the pots are uh, working, not too scratchy. Um, we'll give it a clean up and and see uh, if we can improve any of that. So we've got the Variac on. It's a set to zero volts. We've got four four volts AC there going into the amp at the moment. Both switches are on standby and power. So we'll just check on this meter. A few little spots just at that tiny input voltage. <clears throat> Set it to, yeah, we're on DC. No, they weren't on. <laughs> so, <laughs> just check the plates. 14 volts on one side, 14 on the other. Screen supply, 14 volts. 
each screen pin 14 14 14 and 14 yep each control grid minus 1.2 that's showing that our buy supply is working minus 1.2 Minus one point, well, more like 1.3, 1.3, So that's on the actual pins. Negative voltage present on every pin, so that's promising. Uh, let's slowly ramp up the voltage, and we'll see how she reacts. Up to 20 volts AC input. Monitor one of the plates where we're going, or just a B plus. We're at 88 miles an hour go up to 50 volts and just double check everything <clears throat> 50 volts input the screen's gone up to 200 that's the pin on the actual socket Control grid's gone to negative 21. It's a bit sketchy this amp. Uh, you've got the screen supply on a bare wire running across and right behind it you're trying to get to the control grid so you could slip and give the screen supply straight to the uh, the control grid if you weren't careful. That's 21, all right, so all that's still happening. 190, this is our preamp nodes. <clears throat> 190. 100 there. 200 there ish. So they're in series. Uh, so let's just check. We should have a little bit of signal now. Quite there yet. All right, we'll keep going. So the relays click. Got 70 volts. We're drawing 41 watts, so that's promising. We're starting to see the valves conduct down here. That's the anode current of the inner two 6L6s. I've oh, got signal. Let's just turn that down again so we don't deafen you. Go up to 100 volts. Seems like a bit of an imbalance there in the uh, two valves, but often you don't know the full story until you start approaching their operating point. And then they level out again. 100 volts. Nothing's running away. Check where our plates are now. 375. 375. So we're set to the silicon rectifiers and the bold, which means the highest voltage uh, possible with the amp. The vacuum tube rectifier uh, will drop probably another 20, 30 volts and with the spongy bolt switch drops drops a fair bit as well. <clears throat> Alright, you can see those uh bias voltage sitting around minus 42, 43. And those valves have evened out pretty nicely now. You can see they're sitting around 16 milliamps. Um, so let's take it up to 120. Now I can hear an audible hum, not from the speaker, but from the transformer itself, which as I mentioned in the previous previous video, it's probably this transformer's not the happiest running on 50 hertz. Being a rather small core, a supposedly 100 watt amp. So we're at 120 volts there, and we're sitting at around 22 to 24 milliamps on those two valves. 
and that's at a plate voltage of 456 yeah, 455 so 456 at 120 volts AC now watch this I'll turn it off there'll be a pop from the relays and the voltage goes up the mains voltage goes up to 125 so that's the variac sagging under load as well um, so just back on that well it's still warm so we're drawing about 150 watts idle and that's with the bold, the sag switch set to bold and the uh, silicon rectifier. So let's go to the uh, other winding. I might just turn it off for that so we don't get a pop. And now we're drawing 107, 105 watts. So it draws less current. There's less voltage on the secondary. Yeah, settle down at 105. So let's turn it off again, we'll go to the rectifier. See what the mains draw is with that. Let's drop down to about 93 watts. So it makes a big difference how much uh, quiescent current draw. So with this set to the spongy setting and the uh, vacuum rectifier, Take some voltages. Got 368 plates, 368 screens sitting at 367. That's on the pin. Same, same, same. We've got our grids sitting at minus 43.7. Preamp nodes sitting at 328, 329, 343, 367, 368. So it looks like there's been no catastrophic fault, so that's great. One thing to note, uh, see how much dissipation's dropped with the spongy setting as well as the vacuum tube rectifier. So that's what I'm saying, there's, it's not optimal changing the voltages on the primary um, and just having rectifier slash silicon uh, diodes because you're not re-biasing the output stage so it's all just guesswork and there's no adjustment on, on well I think any mess of boogie there's no adjustment for the bias it's all just hardwired um, and you've got to actually remove components and replace them with different values to get to get adjustment or install a trimmer pot somewhere but um, so yeah as soon as you start playing with the voltages, everything becomes a compromise, and you know you've got to be aware of that. So, don't set your bias up for the lowest setting. Set it up for the worst case scenario, well, highest voltage scenario, which is bold on the switch and silicon rectifier, and also give the AC a little bit of a margin. The AC varies quite a bit, so set it to 120, but. You might want to, particularly on an amp that's high gain, you might want to think about biasing a little bit towards the cooler side because most of the distortion is uh, originating from the preamp anyway uh, and the average output goes pretty crazy um, when you're cranking up a fully distorted signal. And just uh, have a bit of margin there for, for mains fluctuation. Some days it might approach, well in the US might approach 130, 135. I've heard from some guys in the States. Uh, over here the mains voltage varies quite a bit from 230-ish, 228. I've seen probably the lowest up to 256, which was a pretty big margin. Um, and that would significantly affect the operating point of the output valves and possibly other points in the amp as well. Right, so we're just going to uh, quickly calculate the bias on those inner two valves. We'll flick it out of standby, let it settle. 25 milliamps at the plate voltage of 460. So, pretty easy, 0.025 because it's in amps, so uh, 25 millivolts by the plate voltage of 
I've already forgotten. What is it? Four six. We'll say four sixty. Cathodes are at uh, ground potential. So that's eleven point five watts, and now they're thirty watt valves. So that divided by thirty, about thirty eight percent dissipation, which is pretty bloody cold. But um, I've seen messes come in with like twenty. 25 percent and <laughs> they're happy with the sound so it's like whatever do you warm it up or not um so we might might visit that just have a listen and maybe warm it up a little bit i, I think the optimal for a high gain amp somewhere between 50 55 percent when the uh crossover distortion starts disappearing a bit um so we'll have a look at that we might be able to replace some resistors from the top without having to remove the board because that would be a over budget for this job Right, so while we've got it up and running, we'll just check the sound of it. Just running some 1K sign into it. Fair bit of hum there. That's maxed out though on the clean channel. Uh, and it also doesn't have a top cover. So that's again all the way down, everything else set to 12 o'clock and we're just changing the master volume. Check for microphonics and stuff while we're there. That second valve's a little bit poppy. Possibly on the way out. I think that's V2. All the others seem fine. Uh, we'll just click over to the other channel. So that that's the game pot all the way down. That's significant leakage. I, I don't know exactly what's causing that, but I, I've seen that on pretty much every messer. It could be a combination of poor um, uh, poor laying out of the the power nodes to each triode. Uh, it could be a ground trace, uh, surfboard traces just too close to each other. Uh, it could be the pot not zeroing out. Um, it could be a few things, but that's a fair bit, of, fair bit of uh, leakage there with gain all the way down. That's probably max, max down. That's probably putting out five watts. And a fair bit of harm. Let's just turn that off for a sec so we can detect the background levels. Some, something's on the verge of oscillation there as well. You can hear it just trying to run away as you crank the master all the way up. And that's with the gain all the way down still. So again, all of that noise being generated within the amp. It's not the input. Ooh, it's good, isn't it? Oscillating. And nothing plugged in. That's an example of shit PCB layout, really. Um, right there is me demonstrating a poorly laid out amp. It oscillates by itself with nothing plugged into it. I'd love to go to a guitar shop now that I know all the stupid shit with messes and just go to every one of their amp and pretend like I'm trying it out and just crank everything up. Oh, why does it do that? Why does it do that? Why does this one do that? Why does that one do that? I'd love to see the look on their face and what they've got to tell me. Oh, they just do that. It's just it's just how they are. You know, you've got to you got to live with it. It's like um, you know, BMWs or whatever having their quirks, or Ferraris driving like having real hard suspension. <laughs> it's just it's so finely tuned that you you need to know how to use it properly in order for it to not fail. And it's like what? So that's gain twelve o'clock. Master twelve o'clock. Say the gain will take it three o'clock. Master. You can just hear it trying to go there. It's about two o'clock. And then past that, it just runs away. And that's preamp oscillation too. You can tell it's uh We could possibly reroute everything and get rid of that, but um but then it wouldn't be a messer anymore. So <laughs> let's just have a play with um, Thank <laughs> you. 
So that pot is really microphonic. Could be that cap, bladed cap, um, treble blade cap, sorry, bright cap. That's what I'm trying to say. Silver mic is really sensitive too. It's getting more noise when I touch the pot. In theory, that should be grounding me, so. Interesting. Let's just take out little ground lug we got here for the multimeter. <laughs> you can play it like a synthesizer. So hitting it with ground triggers it? Weird. So I might just tighten that pot up. There's every uh, possibility that it's the pot not grounding to the chassis properly through the layer of paint that they don't remove. I don't think it's that cap because you'd hear that at that level again. So yes, layout is important, boys and girls. It's not just to look pretty for Instagram, it's actually got functional reasons for it being neat and tidy. Not only that, but in this case, board layout. Anyway, well, there was no reports of that being an issue, so it's probably outside the usage case for this customer. We'll probably deal with that when we come to it because I'm not a fan of redesigning shitbox amps to um, to perform really well. Bending over backwards, uh, spending a lot of time that you can't charge them for or they don't want to pay to make a poorly designed amp perform really well because um, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, if you want a really well designed amp, go buy a really well designed amp. I'll give you advice on that if you'd like. but. Uh, this ain't one of them. So I clicked over to the clean channel, the green channel. It's displaying the same thing when I touch the uh, when I touch the game knob. Hum gets loud. Not supposed to be the case. Interestingly. Uh, even the green channel oscillates. <laughs> Push it hard enough. So that's green channel maxed out. It's a master at 10 o'clock and the unit, the whole thing's starting to oscillate again. <laughs> this is the fun of messes, like, you just. They were never good, they never will be. So these pots are plastic shafted, which means that when you touch the knob, it's not grounding your body. So that's why they don't, well that's why they get louder when you touch them, because all of a sudden this, this knob's become at your body potential and picking up whatever crap your body's picking up. And it's right near the sensitive uh, signal lines in that area, so there's no way to fix it really, other than replacing the pot with a metal shaft one. Uh, and you've got all the others that are uh, the same type anyway. Alright, so we'll have a listen while it's fired up. So we're on the clean channel. Everything's 12 o'clock except the master. Very sensitive at that level. step there when you turn the master up. I believe it's an audio tape apart. 
hard to see. I think the uh, the code's on the other side of the wafer. I'll crank the clean all the way up. Game. <laughs> It's the orange channel, which is set to clean. Set it to just the orange channel. Of course, I'm right near the thing and it's got a ton of gain, so. amounts of gain, that's maxed out on the orange. So it's 12 o'clock, <coughs> we'll go to the red channel. It's at 12 o'clock on the gain, everything else 12 o'clock. More bottom end to it. I mean, the sit. I like that that tone. Um, it's just all the other bullshit that goes along with it. Sounds reasonable. So that's with everything set to uh, bold and silicon rectifier. Let's see how it performs at that cooler bias setting that presented by the uh, soft, uh, the spongy switch and the uh, vacuum tube rectifier. So distorted, you can't tell. <laughs> Let's go to the clean. And the switching on these things is complex. strong. Bit of noise there but it's a mess up so that's normal. <laughs> uh, we'll power it down, attach it to the load, just check that it's putting out the full power, uh, leave it under say 10% power for a good couple of hours before we uh, call up the customer and uh, say it's ready to pick up this afternoon. We'll put it back together, clean up the case and uh, send her out. So thanks for watching again Champion, sorry this one was a bit disjointed, um, it's been really busy, it's the end of the year, uh, it's just brutal in retail and repair services, Christmas, you're glad to see the uh, the end of it to tell you the truth, but anyway, hopefully we see it through, it's been the hardest year of my life probably, started off with a knife through the foot and um, been playing catch up ever since and two years of COVID, so hopefully things get a bit easier. Anyway, I'll catch you on the next one. Take it easy.